Okay, so um, I want to welcome everyone to this uh, symposium on submucosal glands uh, on mucus secretion and defense. Uh, my name is Tony Fisher. I'm from the University of Iowa, and I'm uh, chairing this session with Wanda O'Neill from the University of North Carolina. Um, we all can agree that cystic fibrosis is a disorder of mucosillary transport. Um, people who have cystic fibrosis fail to clear mucus from their lungs. And mucosillary transport is a very complex phenomenon. It requires the coordinated activity of mucus to trap the particles and uh, the molecular motors of cilia to remove them. But how is mucus made and why is it abnormal in cystic fibrosis? Well, today's symposium is going to focus on submucosal glands, which are an important source of mucus in the airways. And our speakers today have made impressive contributions to our understanding of submucosal gland physiology and mucus production. Um, these are our speakers today. We have um, Gunnar Hansen, Linda Ostegard, Takafumi Kato, uh, Jeff Wine, and Carlos Mila, who will be joining us. Um, Wanda uh, created these nice uh, uh, slides here uh, uh, showing, showing that um, each, of the, each of our speakers, Dr. Hansen, will be talking about MUC5B and MUC5AC and links to airway pathology. Linda Ostegard will be talking about submucosal glands and airway host defense and what we've learned from um, pig models. Dr. Cotto will be talking about a unifying hypothesis of submucosal glands and surface epithelial dysfunction in CF. And we'll wrap this up with a, um, a combined discussion with uh, Dr. Jeff Wine and Dr. Carlos Mila, who will talk about submucosal gland fluid secretion and, and its link to airway mucus transport. All right, so with, uh, with that, let's, let's get started. And our first speaker is um, uh, Dr. Hansen. I think you can hit the start button there. We just have to hit the oh, start, that's the start oh, button. Oh, yeah. Or it lost. And then I think, oh, yeah, 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 that's good. I think ah. you have to click on this once to to uh, allow yourself to. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me here, and I'm really happy to be back again to these meetings, which I enjoyed for many years. Uh, I will today uh, start out with uh, something that's nothing to do with the submucosal glands. I will talk a little bit about. Uh, 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 small intestinal mucin secretion, just to give you a glimpse of I th what I think the much more complicated effect of CFTR than we have appreciated so far. But then I will talk about structure of mucins and, and uh, uh, some other things like that. So we had uh, a recent paper in, in uh, Science Signaling, and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, in the small intestine you, you have a mucus layer which is in the, in the mouse uh, affected by CFTR and that's why it's easy we have published a number of papers on, on that before and uh, uh, we, we know quite a lot about that. The interesting thing is that by ICD coline you can clean and empty the crypts. So, so this is a system for cleaning them from bacteria if they enter into the system. Uh, if you then use entroids to and stimulate them with uh, uh, with carbocol, you get this type of phenomena. What it is is that uh, uh, it, it is a Mac2 mucin, which is the one you have in the intestine. It's labeled uh, green in this case, and you see how it is kind of f filling up the crypt and then fill an opening or uh, cleaning what's in inside it. And when we look a little bit more into detail of this, it turns out that it is due to a receptor on the goblet cells. And the goblet cells are then uh, activated by uh, IP3 to get a calcium signal that triggers the release. And then via gap junction, you are coordinating the phenomena with the neighboring cell, which contains a CFTR channel. I will also say there is CFTR here also, I'll come back to that. Uh, but if you block this channel, you see here, this is playing, as you can see, but it doesn't really empty the, the, the crypt, showing that you need to have the fluid secretion from the adjacent cells to, to work out. When we looked in our single cell data sets, it turned out that there is CFTR channels in, 
in, in all the goblet cells of the crypt. And there's less than in, in the surface cells, but there is substantial amount. There is nothing in the other goblet cells of the small intestine, it's only in the, in the crypt. And if you then make this type of enteroids from the uh, knockout mice or the delta 5 weight mice, you see here, and you stimulate, you see that the, 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 there's something happening in, in, the, in the goblet cells, but they're not exactly the normal, the normal uh, way. They don't come out into the lumen, so they really don't empty, showing that the CFTR is needed in the goblet cells to have a normal function. Interestingly enough, in these cells, it turns out there's an alternative way of secretion that uh, we haven't seen before. And uh, it's placed down here, but you can look on the photos on the way. You see first the goblet cell here, you see the granular uh, field, and then when you stimulate, you start to see that it starts to lower the intensity of the, of the color, which means that the granular disappears, and then it start, fills up the whole. Still, you see the outline of, this, of the whole cell, and it is filled up like this, and finally at the very end, it bursts and everything comes out. And we call this expanding secretion, which means that the, the mucus is expanding inside the cell before it's released. And if you look on electromicroscope, which is of course very difficult to put in order, but based on the uh, videos we can do that. So in the beginning you see the granular, and then they become more diffuse and a little bit bigger, and you can start to see remnants of the, of the membranes. So and most likely what's happening is that the, the mucins are, as you know, with all, all the carbohydrates, very uh, they can expand very easily. So what happens is that you, the water or, or ions rushes in and then the, the, the granules are, are expanding and, and, and filling up the mucus. But, and the intensity that you see, you can't see it, you see inside the cells, is much smaller than it is outside. So you have first an expansion inside the cell and then you have the burst and then it comes out. After 30 minutes, the goblet cell recovers again and starts to fill up again. Remarkable events, which again tells us that mucus secretion is different from many other things which we have studied in cell biology before. So, coming to my main topic today is to talk about the mucins. There are two mucins in the lungs, and one is called 5B and the other one 5AC. In the upper airways is very easy because then you have the they're very well separated in the normal normal situation. You have the 5B in the glands and you have MAC 5 bc on the surface. But you also have uh, MAC 5 bs on the surface in the distal airways and in the, in the mouse. In disease is different, I will talk about at the end. When you come to these, uh, uh, they both of them form dimers in this end and they form covalent dimers in this end. But the MAC 5 bc is doing more things. I will try to tell you what you know about it so far. We made a structure, not of, the, not of any of these, but of the Mark II museum, which have the same type of, of structure uh, in the sea terminal end. And, and uh, it, it's held together down here by that sort of bone. In the, in the case of the Mark II, it's also held together up here in this end before the, the museum domain starts. So it is really having a, this 800 amino acids, which we really don't understand what it's doing because it doesn't unfold, it doesn't contribute to the, to the uh, uh, structure of the, of the uh, of the polymers in, in that way. When you come to the 5AC, uh, uh, it, it is in this D3 domain of the first part of the molecule. It is forming a covalent dimer, as I said, but it also has a tendency to form a, a, a dimer, non covalent dimer based on, on non covalent interactions. So it can form net-like structures, but it can also form linear structures. And it's fa in fact, it turns out that there is much more to this than we have understood, uh, because now when we have the structure, we can look into a variation in amino acids here. And, and there are things here which I think will also affect some of the things that relates to cystic fibrosis. But anyhow, the mac 5 ec mutant can form different type of structures. And this is not only because of the internal land, it's also because of these D domains which are what the 100 amino acid domains which are sitting inside the mucin domains. Uh, uh, we have seven or nine in these two mucins. And, and we have the structure of those, and it looks roughly like this. So we have the, if you have the, the mucin domains and the length of, of the glycans here, it protrudes out, in, so they, it extends out. And it turns out it has a tendency to 
non-covalent bind to each other one to one. And, and it's interesting enough is that it's not different D domains, different Swiss D domains have different intensities in this binding. Or, or affinities in the binding, suggesting that there is some kind of pattern in how these are organized. And this is also contributing to the kind of more net-like structure which is formed by the Mach 5 c mucin. The 5B mucin is much more similar because, uh, much more simple, because it's more like we have expected. It's forming linear molecules. And I will go through some of the things we published before. And it is that in, in the cells, when you pack them, you pack them on the N-terminal land, and, and uh, then the rest of the mucin domains are pointing out. Down here, you have the C-terminal coming back and forth like this. And this is based on the low pH in the secretory granular. Why doesn't it play? Sorry. Ah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, uh, what is happening there is that if you have what I just told you in the in the granular, you have you have it bound to the N-terminal end and with uh, bicarbonate from from the uh, cells down in the corner here. Uh, and this was Jeff Wine, and we, we discussed it in an afternoon at Stanford and figured out how this worked. And, uh, and then uh, you, you, you can open this and you can pull it out. Because if you have a flow that is faster than uh, or, or liquid, then it's faster than the music, they will come out and, and, and be able to unfold, I can see here. So, uh, and then when it comes out on the surface, you can see these bundle strands. We, we, the Iowa group call them strands, we call them bundles, so now we call them bundle strands to be in, in between, to say that we talk about the same thing, <laughs> and, and which we are, we talk about the same thing. And, and uh, they come out on the surface, and, and you can see them here, you see the cilia here. And these bundles are roughly in the range of one to, to 5,000 uh, molecules packed together into these very thick uh, uh, things, which you can then see even on the on the surface, they're sweeping the the surface of the of the uh, uh, upper airways, and it's in that direction. And by that, it can probably pull with it uh, things. The interesting thing is that they're moving in perpendicular to the flow, and they're also moving a little bit staccato-like, and that is kind of interesting in in the which we don't really understand how how that works. And you can see here if we do the same thing and have have the, um, in this case, the 5B is labeled uh, uh, green and bacteria are red. You see how it can sweep the surface and bring the bacteria with it. And, uh, and if you are a cystic fibrosis uh, pig, these are made on pigs, you cannot move it. I think we will hear, see more about that by Linda's talk. And this is just a simple animation showing that the, the flow of the liquid is is faster than the, the movement of, of these uh, bundle strands, which are then sweeping the, the surface. And these bundle strands are really uh, Mach 5b in the central part here, as you can see. This is a confocal, so it's cut through. And here you have uh, the 5ac mucin on the surface coating and most likely being one of the reasons for why it's held down onto the surface. But here we really don't know exactly how this works, and it, it's, uh, it's really it, it's a kind of a mystery. This is also to, to show that then, uh, as pointed out from, from Iowa, is that there are also thin threads from the surface uh, uh, that are coming from the surface, which is mostly five. I see here it, it looks a little bit, you, you don't see really the, the threads, but you see that it brings things with it and it's moving, uh, moving things also upwards with the cilia beating. And there is no, as we can understand, it, there's, there's no difference in the CF and non CF how, how this works, as you can see here. I just wanted to point it out that the, in mouse uh, it's different because they don't have glands and uh, uh, they have one gland, maybe two. Uh, in the upper, very upper airways, and this is maybe similar to what it is in the more distal airways, because there you have the 5B mucin at the surface, and these are forming 
strands also, but these are thinner. They are they are not as thick as the ones you get from the from the from the glands, which means that uh, uh, there are not so many molecules in it. There are enough, of course, to this. We can sometimes see a little bit of of, of these strands, but they also gather into what we have a tendency to call clouds, and and uh, which is sweeping the surface. And it's clear if you look on the 5C knockout mouse that it's it is really only the 5B muson which is forming this. So it's clear that we have to be aware of that the different parts of the lungs in, in the human lungs is different. The distal airways where you don't have any glands is cleaned by different ways than the upper airways. And mouse is more likely that like the distal airways. If it's just because of size, we don't know, but it's it's at least something. Finally, I just wanted to say, oh, I have six minutes to go. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, then I wanted to say a few things about what happens in disease. In, uh, because I, I, so far I only talked about normal situation. In disease, you know, what the first thing that happens is that you express both the 5AC and the 5B mucin in the same cells. And you also uh, uh, ex start to express a number of other cells. And in fact, we and Kesemer has worked on, on mucus from COPD patients and CF patients. And the interesting thing is that there is a number of molecules here uh, which we normally don't see in the lung, which comes up. We don't see it in the normal lung. And, and the top of that is the amount of mucus, especially the 5C increases. But the, the most interesting thing is that you start to see something which we know from before, which we worked on and published. 2008, which has really been my main publication ever in my life, showing that there is a mucus layer in the large intestine which is stratified and is separating the bacteria from us. And you see the same, as I say, you see similar molecules here coming up. And the interesting thing in the, in the COPD patient and the cystic fibrosis patient and in the cystic fibrosis pig, if you keep that for a long time, you see the same type of stratification. And you see how how here it is, if you stay in, it is a mixture of the 5B and the 5C mucus. So you're forming a mucus coating, which is a, a, a combination of these two mucus, showing that exactly why you need both of them there, I don't know, because the long threads, the long, long Mach 5B is maybe holding things together, whereas the 5C with this more net-like structure is maybe contributing to the, to the, uh, yeah, to the, certification or, or the uh, protective effect. The Mark II mucin to mention in the colon is, is more like 5AC, so it probably you know, get, gets you some idea of that. When you induce a, a, a mucus layer in the mouth, oh, in fact, if you put bacteria in a normal mouse, uh, uh, you will see that the, the bacteria here are white, are coming down exactly on the, on the epithelial surface. This is only stained with a with the nuclei, uh, and they, they, there is nothing that protects them. But if you induce a mucus layer by IL-13 or elastase or uh, IL-1 beta, you, you generate a, a mucus, which is red in this case, and if you put bacteria in that, you see that the bacteria, uh, this is made in mice, of course, uh, you see the bacteria is on or in the mucus, but not really down on the epithelia. And uh, uh, so in a way, it kind of protects the, the epithelial cells. If you look on it and stain it, you see it's a mixture of, of uh, <coughs> green, which is 5B, and red, which is uh, mach 5 c and you see it's anchored in the goblet cells like this. And if you then take uh, tissues of this and, and look at them, in the normal case, you, as I said, you don't see any mucus in, in the mouse, but if you induce a layer uh, a mucus, you, you see that you get plugs and you get uh, like this, but you can wash away by incubating with normal PBS or with 7% sodium chloride, you, you can wash away the plugs, but you still have the coating. You cannot get rid of the coating, so showing to me at least that this binding of this mucus layer to the surface is the key to understanding. And it's the same thing in the colon. It's this binding to the, to the surface, epithelia, which is the most important thing. And we don't understand how that works yet. Finally, uh, I will just show a few th things from a paper which was just published in in uh, the Journal of Respiratory Critical Care, and together with Burton Dickey, we have been looking into goblet cells from from 
diseased animals and uh, and uh, uh, humans. That means that uh, uh, you have expression of both the 5C and the 5B in the same goblet cells. But the interesting thing is also, it's not only in the same goblet cells, they're also packed in the same granular. So here is one granular, and again we're coming back to the nomenclature here, that green is, for those of you who can see that green, are uh, uh, separated from the red uh, 5C. And this is, this is done in, in mouse. In this case, in a mouse, we're made to report the mice with a, uh, uh, we have two mucins labeled, and then it's, as I say, easy to, to see. You can also let stain by antibodies, and you see the same thing. So, for some reason, they are mixed in, when you get the diseased goblet cell, you mix the two mucins together, in, even in the same granule. And of course, I don't understand why that is important, but it seems to be a, a feature, at least. At least. And if you look on humans, uh, which was also done in this paper, COPD and cystic fibrosis patients, you see the same thing. You see something which is uh, slightly different maybe from humans to mice, is that uh, you quite often see a core of the 5B and a surrounding uh, 5AC. So they organize in some way inside the granule. Exactly why that is, uh, again, don't understand. But when they are secreting, of course, this has to be secreted together and, and uh, maybe that is important for how to form the, the mucus layer. So, to finish, CFDR is, in goblet cells is, is there and is required for normal mucin secretion, at least in the small intestinal crypt. And you know there is also CFTR in the, in the lung, in some of the lung uh, goblet cells, and it's probably an, a very important issue to understand. The mac 5 b form linear molecules, whereas the mac 5 is from more complex net-like structures. So this is built into the molecules, what, what they're doing and how they're behaving. Thick mac 5 b bundle strands are formed by submucosal glands, and the 5 b are secreted from the surface, mucin secreting cells, and 5 b strands are also secreted from surface cells in the small airways and also in the, uh, in the humans and the mouse. And an attached colon-like mucus layer based on the mac 5 c and 5B is formed in diseased lungs. And 5B and 5 c are packed in the same granulate disease. So by that I would like to, to thank you and, uh, and show the, the constellation of groups we have. Um, for the moment surrounded by eight different PIs and uh, working on different things. All, all of them working on, on, on intestine effects, so it's only me which, which have a shrinking group up here which is continue to work with, especially with the, with the lungs. So, thank you. Thank you. Good, thank you. Amen, it's in time. Yes, you're yes. You're a good example for all students. <laughs> and be sure to uh, record your questions in the, uh, in the chat box, and then we will uh, uh, ask questions of all of our speakers after after we are done. Thank you very much for that excellent talk, uh, Dr. Hansen. And Dr. Ostergaard will now speak to us. Okay. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to be talking about submucosal glands and airway host defense. Oops. Do I have to hit something else? Start. Uh, I think you have to click once uh, in in this in this area, and then. Oh, with I, that. Think you're okay. able to I have no to conflicts go. of interest to disclose. So I'm going to present to you a model of the airway so we can talk about host defense. So the airway, it consists of both a surface epithelia with goblet cells, ciliated cells, ionocytes, and secretory cells, as well as a submucosa gland under the surface epithelia in the submucosa, which has mucous cells and serous cells. And for defense, both the surface epithelia and the submucosal glands secrete mucus. Goblet cells secrete um, 5AC, shown here in green threads, into the ASL or the airway surface liquid overlying the surface epithelia. They also secrete 5B as threads. But they also secrete antimicrobial peptides, and I show these here as green diamonds. The submucosal glands secrete 5B, and they secrete that as strands, as Gunnar showed us, they come up through the submucosal gland duct and then they break away 
and they bind to bacteria in the airway surface liquid and they're taken out of the lung by mucociliary transport. Now, um, if we look at the antimicrobials that are secreted, the defense molecules from the submucosal glands, which we're talking about today. This is work that was done by Yuling Zi in our lab, who used wild, newborn wild type pig trachea, pinned it out, and then stimulated it with methylcholine and collected just the submucosal gland secretions, much like Jeff has been doing for years. And he, he <clears throat> we did proteomics. And we found a lot of defense molecules. I show four of them here, BPI, FB2, LTF, lexaparin, DMBT1, and MUC5B. In addition, we did trachea washes. So we take a trachea, we wash it, and collect the proteins that are secreted into the ASL. And so now we have both surface epithelial secretions and submucosal gland secretions. And I'm going to show you the same, and we did proteomics of this. I'm showing you the same four defense molecules and you can see, if I look over here, we did it under both basal conditions where there was no um, stimulation and a trachea that was stimulated by methylcholine. And what you can see is that all four of these defense molecules had a significant increase in secretion after methylcholine secretion from the submucosal glands. Now, the MUC5AC is here at the surface. Epithelia shown here in green. The MUC5B is also in the surface epithelia, but now you can see that in contrast to MUC5AC, it's also present in some mucosal glands, and it's secreted from those glands as strands. And here, I'm showing you an image of an excised trachea that's been fixed and then stained. And here, it's been stained in red from MUC5B, and you can see the <coughs> MUC5B strands arising from the submucosal gland ducts here up as strands up into the airway surface liquid. The MUC5AC is shown here as goblet cells, and then they secrete the strands which come up and intertwine with the MUC5B strands. Tony Fisher in our lab also pinned out tracheas, and he then submerged them in a bath that contained red fluorescent beads. And the red fluorescent beads will track a mucus strand. And here, you can see a mucus strand arising, tracked by the MUC5B, coming right up out of the gland and then breaks off. And so this is what happens in real life. However, in CF pigs, that strand clearance and movement is different. So here, Mark Hoger has taken excised tracheas from either a non-CF pig newborn, shown here on the left, or a CF pig newborn, shown on the right, He's pinned them out and submerged them in a bath, now with green fluorescent beads. And what you're going to see is the mucus moving. In the non-CF trachea, the, the mucus flows. It's stimulated by methylcholine, and then we get a lot of flow. But notice how that mucus just comes up and out and is cleared and collects at the edge of this excised trachea. In contrast, if we look at the CF trachea, the mucus comes out, but it's not flowing to the sides. It's aggregating on the surface. It accumulates. And so, in contrast to the non-CF trachea, where the surface is cleared, in the CF trachea, that mucus accumulates. Why could that be? If you look at a vertical section of those tracheas that have been stained for 5B and 5AC, what you can see here is that in CF, the submucosal gland is full of 5B, shown in red. And then that 5B going up to the surface fills that duct. In essence, it's blocking it. And when it comes to the surface, it's not released, but it stays there and is coated by 5AC. So this blockage of submucosal glands or a failure to release highlights the failure to release mucus strands. And this results in mucus accumulation on the airway surface and failure to remove the bacteria, which can ultimately result in infection. And thus, submucosal gland secretions are important for airway defense, as we've talked about, but they can also contribute to disease as such as NCF. So what, happened, what would happen to airway defense if, if an animal didn't have submucosal glands? So we hypothesized that if we could eliminate submucosal glands in pigs, we would impair two key respiratory defenses, bacterial killing and mucociliary transport. So there is a disease, hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, or HED, 
that where the formation of ectodermal appendages is defective. And people and animals with this disease have altered tooth and hair distribution, and they lack some sweat and respiratory glands. And so here, I'm showing you that diagram I showed earlier of a wild type airway with both sub, um, epi surface epithelia and submucosa glands. In an HED animal, there is only surface epithelia. So our hypothesis is that if we make an HED pig, it will lack glands and fail to secrete antimicrobial peptides and 5B strands. So the ectodactylase pathway is necessary for formation of appendages, and it consists of three genes. The EDA gene, which forms a soluble ligand that binds to a receptor, EDAR, that turns on a cytosolic transducer, EDARADD. And this causes formation of glands, teeth, and hair. And here I'm showing you a diagram. We, we chose to mutate EDA. So here's a diagram of the EDA protein. It's a transmembrane protein that's cleaved by furin to release a soluble ligand. And, trimer, and trimerization of alpha helices in the collagen domain form cause trimerization of the TNF domain so it can bind to EDAR. So we chose to delete exon 4 of the EDA gene with CRISPR to eliminate the collagen domain. And so when we targeted exon 4 of, the, of this EDA gene, we got pigs that had deletions or frame shifts in the collagen domain. And we refer to these now as EDA knockout pigs. So these were our initial litters of EDA knockout pigs, and they showed the typical HED phenotypes that have been shown in other animals that spontaneously have HED. Here are two litter mates. This is a wild type pig, a couple of days old, and you can see this nice white hair on this pig, whereas its EDA litter mate sitting here next to it is very pink, as if it has no hair or very thin hair. And that's because if you look down on the back of this pig, you can see that the hair on the pig is alternating patterns of hair, bare skin, hair, and bare skin. They also have bald spots on the top of their heads, and they lack hair on their eyelids in contrast to wild-type pigs that have hair on their eyelids. So the EDA airway actually did lack submucosal glands. And so I show you on the left images of wild-type um, conducting airway, where in the trachea, underneath the surface epithelium, you can see multiple submucosal glands here with the black arrows. In the secondary <clears throat> bronchus, again, multiple submucosal glands, and that extends down as well to submucosal glands in the segmental bronchus. In contrast, if you do the same sections in an EDA knockout pig, there are no submucosal glands from the trachea down to the segmental bronchus. And Dave Meyerholtz in our pathology department quantitated this. He counted the percentage of circumference of each part of the conducting airway that had submucosal glands. And in wild type pigs, shown here in blue, about 60% of the circumference um, had glands in the trachea, 40% in the secondary bronchus, and the wild type pigs had about 5 to 10% submucosal glands in the segmental bronchus. In contrast, there were no submucosal glands throughout the conducting airway of the EDA knockout pig. So submucosal glands are important for airway defense. They increase the number of cells that can secrete. They're proposed to be necessary in acute challenges when you're hit with bacteria or particles and you want a stream of stuff to come out of the glands. They secrete many of the AMPs that kill or disable bacteria, and they're the source of 5B mucin strands that sweep over the airway. So we asked if airway defense would be compromised in these EDA knockout pigs. So we first asked if expression of defense genes was significantly diminished, if clearance from the airways was abrogated because they didn't have 5B strands, and if bacterial killing was then diminished. Oops. So I'm showing you here a volcano plot of gene expression a full width trachea of a wild type trachea, set of wild type tracheas, and EDA tracheas. So here we took tracheas that were, went from the, sub, the surface epithelium through the submucosa down to the um, cartilage. And what you can see in this volcano plot were fold, log 2 fold change on the bottom and um, the p value on the y axis 
is that there are a significant, a large number of genes that are significantly decreased in EDA knockout pigs, and certainly some that are up in EDA knockout pigs. If we drill down and look at expression of some key genes, this confirms the absence of submucosal glands in the EDA, but similar expression in the surface epithelia. So in gray, I'm showing you expression of three key cell types in the surface and genes that in, are indicative of them from secretory, ciliated, and goblet cell. And what you can see in the surface epithelium, there's virtually no change. They look alike. Whereas down here in yellow, I am showing you the results of the submucosal gland. And now these are genes that code for the same proteins that I showed you in the, the proteomics for both mucous cells and serous cells. And what you can see is a significant decrease in the expression of those genes from the submucosal gland. If you look at a heat map, and this shows you gene, defense gene expression because that's what we're interested in today. And what you can see is here is the expression of the EDA knockouts that we did under the blue bar versus the wild types under the pink bar. And here are a number of genes that we know come um, from either the surface epithelia or the um, submucosal gland, and you can see that they're down, most of them are down-regulated in the EDA knockout pigs compared to the wild types, including mucins, antibacterial proteins, and protein-binding proteins. So histopathology and gene expression res results indicate that EDA knockout pigs can serve as a model of submucosal gland-mediated airway host defense. So the first thing that we did was test the bacterial killing in EDA proximal trachea. So what we do is take um, EM grids and we bind the Staphylococcus aureus bacteria to them. We then sedate a pig, open up a tracheal window, and set that grid in that window for one minute. We then take out the grid and stain it with a live dead stain. So down here is a confocal image of a grid from a wild type pig, and you can see both green live bacteria and red bacteria are present in about equal amounts. In contrast, in the EDA knockout pigs, the predominance of the bacteria are green or live. And if we count those, you can see about 50% of bacteria are, are killed in wild type pigs, but less than 25% are killed in EDA pigs. So strands are also absent in EDA, um, ex vivo EDA knockout trachea. Again, and these are studies from Tony Fisher, if we pin out the trachea, we submerge it in a bath of red fluorescent beads, then what you will see, whoops, we'll see strands moving over the area, sweeping over it like a windshield washer in the wild type on the left, but in the EDA knockout on the right, you don't see those strands. And on the bottom, I am showing you the number of strands that went over a certain area. In a certain amount of time, you can see that over 100 were counted in wild type pigs, but either none or a very limited amount in EDA knockout pigs. So they don't make strands. So if they don't make strands, what happens in a live pig, an EDA knockout pig, and a wild type pig? So first I'm gonna show you wild type pigs so you know what they should look like. Here we have pigs which are sedated, and then they're insufflated with tantalum disc. And we use tantalum disc because they can be visualized on a CT and they give us an idea of speed and distance and orientation. And here, I'm showing you an outline of a trachea from the carina to the larynx. And these little colored balloons are indicating the actual tantalum disc that we did in this experiment. And here you can see that under basal conditions, those tantalum discs move up through the trachea, up toward the larynx, and some of them are cleared, but they're all moving to some extent. Now if we stimulate the pig with methylcholine, and you watch those tantalum discs, because of the strands that come out, those tantalum discs are moved up and out and cleared from the trachea. So what happens in an EDA knockout pig? Again, we take the pigs, we sedate them, we insufflate them with these tantalum discs, and then we do the same little colored thing here. And what you can see that under non-stimulated conditions, nothing's going on. They don't even hardly move. They're just sitting there. But 
if we stimulate them with methylcholine, we see the same pattern. And this is because they have no strands and they can't move those tantalum discs out of the airway. So now we know that the two arms of airway defense are altered in EDA knockout pigs. The expression of genes that are important for defense are significantly reduced. There's decreased bacterial killing in the proximal airway. That's the study with the grids. And there's a lack of strand secretion. And I just showed you how you had impaired mucociliary transport in vivo in the animals. So we asked how these pigs would respond to a bacterial challenge. So we instilled Staphylococcus aureus into their airways of newborn pigs. And then four hours later, we harvested and counted whatever bacteria was remaining in the trachea, um, the bronchus and bronchioles, and in lung homogenous. And this is what we found. Down here, I'm showing you the parts of the conducting air of the, actually the whole trachea, that we um, looked at. The trachea, BAL, which includes bronchus and bronchioles and lung homogenous. And on the y-axis is the log CFUs of bacteria. And what you can see is that in red in the, is our, the EDA knockout pigs, and they had significantly threefold more bacteria remaining in their trachea than in the wild type pigs. That was also true in the BAL, where there was significantly more bacteria remaining than in the wild type pigs. And in the lung homogenates, there was no significant difference, but there was a trend toward more bacteria present in the EDA knockout pigs. So in summary, the absence of submucosal gland secretions alters bacterial defense. There's less in vivo bacterial killing in proximal airway. There's a decreased response to a bacterial challenge. And secretion of mucus strands from the submucosal gland is necessary for MCT, or mucociliary transport. EDA knockout pigs don't make strands. In vivo mucociliary transport was attenuated and or absent in the EDA knockout pigs. So our findings provide direct ex vivo and in vivo evidence for the role of submucosal gland in host defense. So in future studies, we'll, we're going to ask if EDA knockout pigs will develop airway disease over time. Everything I've shown you now is from newborn pigs. And if airway disease might require a challenge where they really need some mucosal glands to come forward. So I'd like to thank it, the people who worked here from the University of Iowa CF and Airway Biology Group. It takes a lot of people to do these pig studies. Um, I'd like to emphasize David Stoltz, who is my uh, collaborator on the EDA knockout um, project, Tony Fisher, who's sitting over here, um, Mahmoud, who did the um, CT studies, David Meyerholtz, who um, did the, um, the staining, Yuling Zi, who did the initial um, proteomics, and of course, Mike Welsh. And then I'd like to, um, the staff members, but a special shout out to Margaret Price, Nakasha Warrior, who did the CRISPR to actually make the pigs. And we get the pigs from the University of Missouri from their group, headed by Randy Prather. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for that excellent talk. Uh, now we have um, Dr. Cotto. And be sure to put questions in the, in the chat box here so that we can have a vigorous discussion afterwards. Okay. There you go. Uh, hello, this is Takafemi Kato from UNC Chapel Hill. Today's my talk is about unifying hypothesis of submucosal gland and surface epithelial dysfunction in CF. I do not have any uh, COI to disclose. In the past few slides, I'm explaining some basic knowledge of this field about AI mucus, mucin, and CCF, disease path pathophysiology. So the AI mucus and the mucins are the essential component of the lung defense, and the mucus consists of mucins, many globular proteins, water, salt, and so on. And mu mucus can trap the exogenous microbes and irritants, and they are cleared by mucociliary transport and calf. And in the large airway, we have two anatomical regions that secret mucus, submucosal gland and surface epithelium. And uh, the glandular secretion are transferred uh, from the gland to the surface epithelium through gland duct. 
And in human airway, we have two major secretory mucins, MAC5B and MAC5AC. And of these two mucins, MAC5B is more essential for lung defense. A mouse study showed the MAC5B knockout showed a shorter survival compared to wild type or MAC5AC KO because of the chronic infection and impaired mucociliary transport. This is a case with human. A recent study identified a family with MAC5B mutation and they exhibit chronic infection and bronchi ecstasis. And I'm explaining the expression pattern of MAC5B and MAC5AC in human airways. In the large airway, some mucosal glands secret exclusively MAC5B and surface epithelium secret both MAC5B and 5AC. In contrast, in smaller airway, it lacks in gland, and they secret only MAC5B. And in the very distal part, such as the terminal bronchiole or alveolar region, neither of these things is secreted. This is one example of immunofluorescent co-staining of MAC5B in green color and MAC5AC in red color. And as you can see, the salmucosal glands exclusively secret MAC5B and glandular secretion are transferred via gland duct to the surface, ep surface lumen. And surface uh, epithelia, ep epithelium secret both MAC5B and MAC5AC. And now I'm explaining some pathogenesis of CF airway uh, surface epithelia. And as all of you know, the cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease caused by CFTR mutation that result in the dehydration of airway surface. The left panel is the magnified image of airway surface epithelium, and surface epithelium have the multi-layer pseudostratified structure with many ciliated cells on the top. And this ciliary layer is called periciliary layer, PCL, and above the PCL we have mucus layer. The, in the in vitro experiment, uh, this shows the both mucus layer and PCL are visualized with green color, with the mucins with orange color. After 24 hour uh, incubation in the control condition, this green color with the P7 micrometer PCL are intact after 24 hours. But in contrast, in CF, this uh, green layer got thinner because of the imbalance of secretion and absorption. The, causing the increased mucus concentration and depletion of PCF. The electron microscopic imaging identified the thick mucus and the osmotically compressed cilia. In contrast, in the, the control, we did not see the thick mucus or compressed cilia. This is the pathogenesis of CF surface epithelium. Then question is, what about glands in CF? In this context, we have these, these three questions. The how are gland mucus properties altered in CF? And is gland mucus secretion blocked in CF? And is there a shared pathophysiology for CF surface epithelia and submucosal glands? The, we collected the submucosal gland mucus using the established method by Dr. Steve Ballard in South Alabama. So the, we freshly dissect the peak of a human airway, large airway tissues, and the li li ligate all the branches to isolate the internal space from the outer side, then incubate these dissected tissues in the acetylcholine containing buffer to induce the mucus, gland mucus, to the, the isolated lumen. Then after incubation, we cut the tissue longitudinally and collect the secreted mucus. So the, in the pig experiment, we have four conditions, the acetylcholine only to induce the maximal glandular secretion, and with dimethyl amylorite to block uh, bicarbonate secretion, with dumetanide, with chlor inhibits chloride secretion, and with both inhibitors to limit the gland secretion flow. So in the CF mimicking condition, for example, the acetylcholine with two inhibitors showed the increased percentage solid concentration up to 8%, which is the equivalent level of the CF, CF airway mucus. 
in contrast to the, the control condition around 2% of solid. We measured the osmotic pressure and in the CS condition, the osmotic pressure was increased up to 800 Pascal, which also exceeds the threshold that caused the osmotic compression of cilia in airway lumen. Importantly, the percent solid and osmotic pressure showed a very strong correlation. Uh, we investigate the, the histology of the ground duct and the transmission electron microscopy. And in CF, the, we observe the ground mucus, uh, reten mucus retention in submucosal ground duct with compressed cilia. In contrast, we don't, have we don't see such mucus retention or serial compression in the control condition. Actually, these observations are very similar to what are observed in surface epithelium in health and CF. Then we hypothesize these observations uh, to be similar in human CF. And the answer was yes. And we collect the gland mucus from non-CF and CF tissues, and the CF gland mucus exhibited the increased percentage solid compared to non-CF. And this observation was in line with the previous report by Dr. Ballard uh, showing the CF gland mucus have the higher percentage solid with the limited liquid uh, secretion compared to health. Also the, from the University of Iowa, they use a different collection method of gland mucus, and they also reported the increased protein concentration in CF gland mucus. We measured the osmotic pressure, and it also increased in CF, and the concentration of osmotic pressure showed a strong correlation again in human. And we also measured the cohesive strength of gland mucus, the cohesive strength is the force that is required to tear the mucus. So the elevated cohesion in CF gland mucus may be one reason why the gland mucus cannot be reduced from gland duct, as the, the, the other presenter showed. Again, in human, we also observed that thick mucus retention and compressed cilia in gland duct in human CF tissue. And as the other presenters uh, showed, uh, it is known that glandular mucus form the distinct uh, characteristic uh, strand. And we, we also initially uh, investigated the uh, solubility is different or not between surface and gland mucus. We used the human bronchial epithelial cells mucus as a model of surface mucus. And we collected the HB mucus and pig and human glandular mucus and left the sa these samples in the excess PBS buffer for four days. And the, PB, the HB mucus could dissol completely dissolve into solvent, but the glandular mucus could dissolve about half, and leaving the other half as an insoluble portion. We immunostained that in insoluble portion and confirmed mac 5 positive mucus strand. And in collaboration with the Dr. Timaya lab in University of Georgia, we investigate the glycomic characteristics of surface and gland mucus. We collected HB and gland mucus from three matched non-smoker donors and, and observed the gland mucus consists of uh, more simple, simpler and shorter glycans. In contrast, uh, HB mucus consists of more complicated Glycans. This may be the one explanation is the shorter glycans with less hydroxys can capture the less water molecules and more uh, hydrophobic interaction between mucin molecules may be one reason or one important factor for the gland mucus to form strands. Then we are interested in First, the difference of the gland mucus strand between non-CF and CF, and possibly, uh, presumably reflecting the higher concentration in gland mucus, we observed a higher number of mucus strands in CF gland mucus. And interestingly, we did not see statistical difference in strand widths and length. And 
One interesting thing is that we observed a relatively homogeneous alignment in the non-CF glandular gland strands, but this alignment was totally lost in CF mucus strand. This, this, this organization may reflect the limitation of the submucosal gland fluid flow in CF. So this is the interim summary. The CF gland mucus exhibits increased concentration, osmotic pressure, and cohesive strength. And CF gland duct exhibits mucus, mucus retention and compressed cilia, presumably due to mucus concentration-dependent increase of osmotic pressure. And we predicted the CF gland exhibits failure of secretion of fluid, mucins, and host defense proteins. Then, how can we investigate this prediction in vivo? And then our strategy was to identify selective biomarker for glandular secretion. There are many reports that show that gland uh, protein, such as lactoferrin, AZ, GP1, or lysozyme, we carefully investigate the expression pattern of these markers using immunostraining and RNA in situ hybridization throughout human airway, from proximal to distal airway and alveolar regions as well. So, is these, all these markers are surely expressed in glands, but actually they are also positive in the small airway epithelium or some uh, uh, the positive in the infiltrating immune cells. So these are so-called gland markers, are actually not gland selective. But in contrast, the PRR4, proline-rich protein 4, this marker uh, is expressed in submucosal gland serous cells, but not any other regions of human airways, including large airway, small airway, alveolar region, or any immune cells. And this expression pattern was not affected by any disease status investigated, including CF, asthma, bronchiectasis, and PCT. So this is the immunofluorescent co-staining of PRR4 and MAC5B. The PRR4 in green color stains gland sera cells, and MAC5B red color stains gland mucus cells. And the secretion of these two regions uh, mixed in gland duct and transferred to the airway lumen. Because we could identify PRR4 as a gland selective marker, we hypothesized PRR4 level in CF airway fluid is decreased. So we investigate the PRR4 a peptide level in induced sputum samples collected, collected from healthy control and three diseases, CF, non-CF bronchiectasis, and PCD. And importantly, all these three diseases exhibit submucosal gland hypertrophy. And compared to healthy control, the CF induced sputum had a, showed a significantly lower PR4 level. This is a one evidence that the CF glandular secretion is blocked. And also importantly, two disease controls show the increased level of PRR4. We assume this reflects the hypersecretion of gland. And if we compare the CF, the CF PRR4 level was significantly lower compared to both healthy control and the disease controls. We also quantify the PRR4 staining level in the mucus flakes in BL fluid samples and identify the reduced PRR4 staining in CF mucus flakes. So these, are, these two are the good evidence of the reduced glandular secretion to, in the CF. And also importantly, this reduction of PRR4 is not the production uh, issue. The staining of PRR4 and the MAC5B <coughs> are comparable between control and CF glands. So this is the conclusion slide. We could identify the unifying pathophysiology between surface epithelium and submucosal glands in proximal airway. That includes the mucus hyperconcentration 
due to CFTR dependent luminal dehydration. And increased mucus concentration dependent osmotic pressure and cohesive strength. And depleted PCL compressed cilia and mucus stasis. And future studies include uh, PRR4 levels in CF sputum after tricafter treatment. We assume that tricafter can rescue ground secretion and PRR4 level may be increased. This is under investigation. In this, in uh, the previous study that we did not uh, investigate any functional PRR4 or other prone protein families, so this is also our next interest. We sh also should know the therapeutics, for example, restoring gland mucus fluid flow and over supplementing glandular peptide to CF airways. Yeah, so this research was accomplished by the collaborators in the many collaborators in UNC CF centers and C UNC courts and other universities, such as University of Georgia and South Alabama. I also appreciate the funding support from American Lung Association and the CF Foundation. Thank you very much. All right, now we will have Dr. Wine and Dr. Mila. one yours and I think you have to click one time to one time in there to get it through again. Let's restart this. I'm grateful to Dr. Fisher and Dr. O'Neill for inviting me and grateful to you all for coming. Uh, I have no disclosures. So we just heard some really fascinating talks, and here are some of the key points. We saw that gland mucus is important for killing and removing pathogens, and that there are machines for making bundled mucus strands. We saw that gland mucus is MUC5B with two types of glyc glycosylation, maybe, a soluble and an insoluble type the latter presumably forming strands. And interestingly, PRR4 was discovered to be a much more precise marker for gland secretions, and it is at least 30-fold lower in CF sputum, confirming decreased gland secretion in CF. Music to my ears, of course. Well, what's next? What we'd like to do is how leverage this sub information about submucosal glands and airway physiology to improve airway health for people not helped by modulators. And we propose that a simple intervention with FDA-approved compounds may improve airway health by synergistically stimulating increases in mucociliary clearance. This is the data so far. A combination of calcium and cyclic AMP elevating agonists applied to the airways dramatically increased mucociliary clearance in non-CF, but most importantly in CF airways. And it does this by, in part, increasing gland secretion and inhibiting absorption. I'm going to give a brief overview of this in, this, in the first part of this talk, and Dr. Amia will show progress towards clinical trials testing this approach. Uh, and then Nam Su Ju will give detailed results of how we think this works in workshop 31.5 on Saturday. Now the main method that we have used is to apply agonists to ex vivo tracheas from pigs, ferrets, and, and rabbits and measure vectorial transport of particles. Uh, this is the uh, method we use. It was brought to the, land, the laboratory by Jin Hyuk Jong based on prior work by Steve Ballard. Uh, it's a typical physiological chamber in which you can put paired uh, excised tracheas with the bath independently controlled. 
uh, the par uh, Xerox particles shown in C, about five microns in diameter, are uh, put onto the surface uh, periodically, and then they are transported rostrally at speeds that can be measured uh, with uh, microscopy. Uh, the last slide, the last section here shows that if you don't do anything to the trachea, the fluid that's on the trachea just gets swept away, it becomes drier and drier, and so the speed diminishes. Now, Carbacol stimulates mucociliary clearance volume and gland secretion in ferrets. And what this uh, shows you on the left there is that when Carbacol was added at 15 minutes, at, I think, seven different concentrations, you get a dose-response curve measuring mu of mucociliary clearance velocity being increased. Time is on the bottom. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the maximal velocity we got was 20 millimeters per minute, and that was reached with one micromolar. Uh, going above one micromolar did not give you faster uh, secretion faster velocity. Uh, when we looked at, at gland secretion in different experiments and compared the two dose response curves, you can see they overlapped fairly well. 20, max, 20 millimolar is maximal velocity we saw. I'd like you to remember that. We also uh, established dose response relations for other agonists on both glandular secretion rates on a mucociliary clearance velocity looking at two types, classes of agonists, those that elevated calcium and those that elevated cyclic AMP. When you do that, you see that uh, cyclic AMP elevating agonists give you a very good uh, mucociliary clearance velocity, but very low rates of submucosal gland secretion. When you stimulate with, on the other hand, in the pink uh, oval with uh, calcium elevating agonists, you get a slight increase in maximal mucociliary clearance velocity, but now a 500% increase in gland secretion. So there's a, just, there's a kind of separation between these two phenomena, uh, which I think is interesting, and the question arises what happens when these two types of agonists are combined. Well, this shows the combination the uh, mucociliary clearance velocity is shown uh, on the uh, y-axis and time on the x-axis. When stimulated with either forskolin or carbacol alone, you can see that secretion velocity, uh, you can see that uh, clearance velocity is low, it goes to five or 10. And if you add those two together, it doesn't go up very much uh, in, if you add them arithmetically. But if you combine the agonists, then you get much more than the arithmetic sum. And I want to point out here that we're only using 0.3 micromolar carbacol. Well, this is exciting, we thought, and we wondered what would happen in uh, CF animals. We didn't have CF animals, but then, thanks to uh, John Unghart, uh, we did. And so these show uh, what happens with CF uh, ferrets when pretty much the same protocol is, is uh, carried out. In this case, it was 30 minutes of basal, then the two agonists added independently and then combined. What's particularly interesting to us in a CF ferret is that there is no secretion, sorry, no increase in mucociliary clearance velocity whatsoever with forskolin. But even though it's doing nothing by itself, when added to a very small amount of carbacol, 300 nanomolar, you get basically the same kind of transport velocity that you see from maximal methacholine stimulation in a wild type animal, but only about half as much uh, uh, synergistic secrete, uh, velocity as you see in a wild type animal. Well, what contributes to synergy? There are two components. I'm not I'm talking about components and not mechanisms. Uh, one component is that there is synergistic stimulation of gland secretion itself, 
We've done this in many different ways in many different animals. Just showing you here some human data with very low levels of carbacol and cyclic AMP elevating agonist, in this case, VIP. As you can see, quite a dramatic effect. The other thing is a dramatic decrease in ENAF mediated absorption when you stimulate with carbacol. I thought of a way to explain this uh, very quickly and couldn't. So uh, I think for this crowd, most of you will understand what's going on here. So I'll just say it. Uh, we used, uh, Dr. Nam Sujun used Benzamil to inhibit ENAC mediated absorption uh, and then showed in the presence of Benzamil, carbacol gives you a slight increase in anion secretion. This has been seen over and over and over again. But the interesting thing is if you do carbacol first, then you see a, uh, a follow-on prolonged inhibition of the short circuit current, which we uh, interpret as being due to ENAC-mediated absorption because benzamil does nothing more. The bonus is combining these two agonists, carbacol, which you expect to cause bronchoconstriction, doesn't cause bronchoconstriction in the presence uh, of cyclic AMP elevating agonists. So this is a summary. Vagus uh, efferents stimulate airway intrinsic neurons, which stimulate gland mucus secretion, ciliary beating, epithelial fluid secretion, but inhibit epithelial fluid absorption, giving rise to increased fluid uh, production uh, and faster mucociliary clearance velocity. As shown on the right, we think there are uh, three basic models. In the normal airway, secretion, absorption, and mucociliary clearance velocity are all balanced. If they weren't, you would either fill up with fluid or go dry. In CF, they're not balanced. There's less secretion, more absorption, and so slower uh, clearance velocity with all of the terrible things that then happen. We think synergy by increasing secretion and inhibiting absorption can partially reverse the CF effects. So uh, this work was done primarily by Dr. Nam Su Ju with many collaborators. Uh, he will be giving his talk uh, on airway uh, physiology directed therapies uh, on Saturday and I hope you can attend that. And now for the second part of this talk, Dr. Mia will find out if it actually works. <laughs> going to sort of uh, play tag team. I want to thank uh, Tony and Wanda for allowing us to do this. Yeah, you, you might actually get him. Oh, oh let me just to get you into it. You have a separate PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Let's see. That one? Yeah. Okay. And then we have to click one time on there to get it to advance. Okay. Click. should be able to advance with the keyboard now. Oh, there we go. Okay, so again, thank you for allowing us to do this sort of two-part deal. Um, and you know, as a pulmonary physician, I've always been trained and been on the mantra that mucus is a bad thing. That is good that I've been following you, all of, all of you for <laughs> so many years because mucus is a good thing. It's getting it out, what is important, is when it accumulates that we run into difficulties. Um, and I'm going to just talk about how we're looking at this from the clinical perspective. And Nam Su is going to show on third Saturday things that we've done to try to dissect out a little more, you know, how this works and what are the best um, sort of drugs to think about. But from my end, I've been trying to do more of a translation of what we've been uh, working on in the bench. Um, Recognizing that you know there's still unmet needs when it comes to uh, mucus clearance for CF, whether it's the patients that cannot take hemp or the ones who are on uh, hemp but have bronchiectasis, you know they, they still have 
more like we can think about them maybe as they're already non cf from ketosis, but they do have mucus accumulation, so we still need to think about how to best facilitate that mucus clearance. Um, and the experimental work, I think Jeff has um, given us a good introduction to that, and Namsu is going to show more detail about this. But the important thing is that, you know, we're looking at the, what we call the synergy paradigm can introduce important uh, changes in the mucus clearance irrespective of CFTR function. So we can tell that this is going to work whether you have absent CFTR function or partially restored or restored CFTR function with him, or including uh, when you are under wild type uh, situations. Uh, and it's basically because we're working on more, think about a basic physiology as to what's important to uh, elicit the normal mucus clearance. Uh, and under our un underlying hypothesis is that the combination of cholinergic and adrenergic agonists, what we call the synergy paradigm, and again taking it from the bench work, um, is going to translate into uh, important uh, clinical endpoints when we bring it to the human situation of a mucus obstruction that is characteristic of CF. So for our project, um, I keep showing my disclosures, uh, <laughs> we set off with three main goals, with the ultimate goal to find a therapeutic that can enhance mucus clearance irrespective of the mutation or the condition of a patient, and by using a combination of agonists that is based on repurposing uh, clinically approved drugs. Um, and we said, as I said, three goals for this project. The first one um, is to complete an assessment of different adrenergic and cholinergic agents, and um, Namsu is going to show some detail as to the ones that um, we've been um, more interested on because they're available in the clinic, um, and to select these to move on to a phase one type of program to first uh, do a study on human volunteers, meaning people that we know don't have CF and also don't have uh, lung disease, and with the idea here to start by phase one is safety, so try to do a safety assessment, and this primarily because of a concern of what happens if you use a cholinergic agent on the airway, which is bronchospasm, is what most uh, pulmonary physicians are familiar with the uh, metacoline challenge test. So we want to make sure that we're not doing a metacoline challenge test reproduction by doing this type of uh, uh, test. Um, and then based on the uh, results of this study to identify a maximum tolerated dose and then move into a phase one study, repeat the same exercise in patients with CF with the ultimate goal of identifying a maximum tolerated dose to then think about how to move this into a phase two type of program. So in terms of our number one goal, we have already reached that goal. Um, and we have selected the formoterol as our uh, beta adrenergic agonist for a number of reasons, starting with its availability, but also it has a sort of, it's considered a long acting agent. It has a long, what can be considered long half-life in the airway of about five hours. Um, it, uh, but more importantly, it has a very fast onset of action. Of all the bronco, beta adrenergic bronchodilators available, is the one that has the fastest onset of action, which you see as a major advantage. And the second one is metacoline, uh, more than anything for practical purposes because it's available to move fast into doing a phase one type of study, being not necessarily be the one that uh, we may end up using, but again, it's, it's the availability of this. And believe me, we had to go through a lot of iterations with our IRB to be able to move this forward as an investigator initiated type study. Uh, but it also has fast onset of action and is a sort of a medium half-life. It's not as short as acetylcholine. It's somewhat resistant to cholinesterases, but it's um, much um, less, um, let's say, it still has some susceptibility of cholinesterase. The activity is going to be eliminated from the uh, airway, as opposed to a uh, carbacol, which is what has been done mostly on the uh, in vitro work, which is a very long half-life on work that we've done um, on sweat glands. We can see people still having sweat gland activity at, after 24 hours. So you can really hang out for a long time. And we thought that there's too much liability on something like that. So that's why we pick uh, metacoline. And again, if you want to see more detail, please go to Namsu's talk, and I think uh, it's also a poster. Now, in terms of our goal number two, this is when things get interesting. We've been able to just uh, shortly, not, not that long ago, complete our, um, it was a very busy summer doing our uh, phase one study with healthy volunteers. Um, all subjects completed the study without any um, safety signals. 
and they were treated uh, according to protocol. And these are the doses that we pick. Um, for Motorol, uh, 10 micrograms became our sort of a control um, uh, test drug. And then combinations of Formotrol and metacoline, uh, with the metacoline dose going from one microgram to 12 micrograms. Some of this is extrapolated from the in vitro work, making a good estimate as to what could be an equivalent dose, but also taking into account, you know, the inefficiency of the nebulizers at delivering the, the, the doses that you intend to use. You know, it's very different when you have it on a bath in a prep, as opposed to when you're administering a, to a whole airway to a nebulizer. Uh, but at the same time, trying to keep the safety as our main goal here, and the highest dose is actually three times lower than your uh, dose that um, will be classified on a metacoline challenge as a severe reaction. So your most reactive patient is going to react to a dose that is three times uh, the dose that we have identified here as a high dose, when metacoline is given by itself, not with the bronchodilator. Now, um, as I said, we didn't observe any uh, untoward effects. Um, and here's sort of our main uh, endpoint for safety, which is to look at FEV1. FEV1 is what we use also for metacoline challenge testing. Um, and what we're showing here is that um, the red line, if we will have seen, I think I have to use this. Yeah, okay. So this is what we have called for our IRB and our DSMB a serious adverse event. If people drop in their FEV1 by more than 20%, and it's not percent predicted, it's on the actual FEV1, dropping by 20%. So no one reached that red line. And intolerance per protocol was defined as dropping by 10%, and no one really reached, got close to it, except for this subject, but it didn't get to the intolerance point, that that was our lowest dose of metacoline. And interestingly enough, at our highest dose, we have a few people that actually had what you call significant improvement in FEV1, which we found somewhat interesting. Now, the numbers are really small, but at least that gives us good confidence that we can move then into a phase one exercise with our CF patients. Now, just out of curiosity, among many things, we're also checking our people mobilizing secretions. And interestingly enough, we saw that everyone, including the people that receive only for motorol, you know, can produce sputum in, in good amounts, about five grams or so. It's all over the map, but at least we're seeing that we're getting people to uh, mobilize sputum, and this is gonna be one of the things that we're going to use as an exploratory uh, parameter in our CF patients. Now, interestingly enough, and again, despite the low numbers, we're seeing some interesting trends when it comes to other markers of airway obstruction, like the ratio of FEV1 to FBC and the FEF 2575, which, again, despite the small numbers, we're seeing some interesting trends where the people on the highest doses are having very significant improvements, meaning increases as a, a response to the therapy which is very reassuring, because here we're not trying to demonstrate positive bronchodilator effect. What I want to show is that we're not going to induce any bronchoconstriction of trying to get this mucous mobilization. Um, so in conclusion, you know, so far what we're showing is that, and that formotrol is probably protecting from muscle contraction that will be induced otherwise by the metacoline. Um, and, and there are really good reasons, there's really good like a sort of physiology on the early work done uh, moving forward for Motorol, showing that yes, it can really abrogate any bronchoconstricting effect from cholinergic stimulation. And our early data with the healthy volunteers is supporting that yes, you know, you are protecting them from the bronchoconstriction. On our phase one study in CF patients in progress, in fact, um, I think the team has working really hard and next week we're gonna dose our first subject. So in a few months, I may have a little more to tell about this story as it unfolds. So our work ahead, number one, is obviously to be able to do this um, study with CF patients with doubling our sample size to 24, not just to get really a little better reassurance about the safety with larger numbers, but also include some exploratory points, endpoints. We're gonna look at sputum. We're also gonna do LCI and MCC type measurements with radionuclide studies. Um, obviously, the there are a few big questions which are sort of the next mountains to climb, which is not just how we're going to do a study, but formulation considerations. You know, they, ideally, these two drugs render themselves as good candidates to put them on an MDI, but how can that be uh, formulated is a big question, as well as IND considerations and also what a future study may look like. You know, you'll do it as a short-term study. Everything I've shown here is very acute changes. 
that CF is a chronic disease. So what is going to be the best study to propose to move this forward? So I'll just like to close acknowledging the team as well as uh, Jeff and Nam Su, who you know, have really taught me a ton about what to do about airway disease, and our Stanford IMA program, Chaitan Kosla and Gina Bolli lead this effort, because they give us belief on the idea and give us all the funding uh, for the work that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. So I'd ask our panelists to come up. We'll get you some chairs. We'll share the microphone and we will start to take questions from the audience. Those are very excellent talks and thank you everyone. I'm going to grab an extra okay. chair here. I'll read the questions that we got on the chat. There's only a couple. If you have any questions, go to your app. Or, you know, you guys can stand up and yell, okay? We want a, a good discussion here. These were great talks. And, okay, so the first question I have is to Linda. It's from Fen Wan. And um, Fen asks, does EDA knockout influence CFTR function by electrophysiological methods? Um, so we actually have looked at um, co-stars that have been um, cultured from EDA knockout pigs and their pattern of um, um, inhibition by amiloride or DIDS and um, stimulation by Forsklin and IBMX and um, inhibition by uh, Gly H are the same as in wild type. We see no significant differences there. Um, we've just started some very initial things with looking at um, actual tissue on the oocene and, and I can't say definitively here because we've only done a few uh, pigs. It, they look like they're the same too. Um, if I look at RNA-seq, there really are no differences in um, transporters or um, channels expressed in the EDA knockout uh, different than what we see in wild type. Okay, thank you, Linda. Okay, and then the next question that we have on the chat is from Thomas Lynch. And I think this is directed to Dr. Hansen. So the question is, MUC5B and MUC5AC are mixed in diseased goblet cells. Is this specific to CF, or does this occur also in COPD? It is. Uh, I mean, we have only looked on a couple of patients of COPD and a couple of patients of COPD of CF, but, but it looks more or less the same. So it's, not, it's no big difference between... Uh, between these diseases, and uh, I think it's a more common mechanism. I mean, you, as, as you saw from my pictures, or from you can see from the papers, that it's also looked the same if you do induce uh, sputum uh, in, or in the, induce mice with the IL-13 or IL-1 beta or elastase challenge. All of these gives more or less the same. So I think there is a kind of a common reaction mechanism in, in uh, in the lungs, in the surface cells to, to do that. I also want to point out one thing here, which uh, uh, I mean, some people say sometimes that, uh, for example, in the mouse, that there is five, five AC mucins in, in, in the surface, and there is, if you, if you shell it, if you take from clean animal houses, it's usually very clean in that it's only 5B. It's the same thing is, I think, with, when uh, we too look on, on pigs, we usually talk about newborn pigs, and, and they haven't been challenged in any way, and we never see any 5B on, on the surface. But if you look on adult uh, pigs, we see 5B coming up. So, so this, that they have both of them, and I think it's, it's something which happens with challenge with, maybe not the need to be infection, but of course we challenge with a lot of things, we inhale and so on. So it's, uh, the, the baseline I think is kind of, kind of clear. Okay, very good. So we have a question from Martin Mentz. 
Um, and I think this is to Dr. Wine. So, Dr. Wine, you're going to have to take the microphone here. Have a seat. Um, the question is, will you target specific subsets of patients for your study, or will you exclude patients on the highly effective modulator therapy? That's actually for Dr. Mia. <laughs> <laughs> no, at this stage, we're not going to remember. We're just trying to do a safety assessment, and these patients we know can have error reactivity on top of their CF. So we're going to do all takers and then, again, think more about the question as to how complicated to make a clinical trial more, more if we move into a phase two study. And there, so there's another question for you. Um, how do you deliver the therapies to the CF patient, and how would you propose to improve the submucosal gland specific stimulation? That's for me? Yeah, that's okay. for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we use a high output nebulizer. I think it's the e flow for those in the crowd that recognize nebulizers. Um, but ideally, I think, as I said, the, 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 the ideal is to deliver this as a meter dose inhaler for a number of reasons, including the fact that they have much better penetration into the lower airway. Is that answering your questions? Go ahead. Uh, Captain Posca, Penn, uh, this is for Professor Wine and uh -oh. Dr. Mia. Um, for patients who don't uh, have any CFPR function, what is the rationale for including the, the, uh, the adrenergic agonist? Is there one? In other words, could you just simply use carbonyl or methacolin? So we think forskolin, based on work that you guys have done, uh, <laughs> possibly <laughs> prompting the question, uh, could have effects other than working on CFTR. And we saw that in the, in the uh, tremendous increase that we saw in the CF ferret with when we added forskolin to methacholine. But whether a max, but it only, whether a maximal dose of methacholine could give you the same effect, we haven't actually tested. It's an interesting question. But I bet then you'd get bronchoconstriction. Yeah, and if you go by the poster, uh, we've also done this in my lab just on cell preps with CF cells. Uh, and we're seeing also interesting effects. So taking out the glands out of the picture. So Tony, you had a couple of questions in the discussion for these two folks. You want to just yeah. go ahead and ask them? Yeah. So uh, let's, let's start with uh, uh, Dr. Hansen. So what implications does the, this expanding secretion have uh, for, for CF and for the assembly of uh, 5B and 5AC in the airway? I mean, I, I really, to be honest, I don't know, I mean, because it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, what it is, it's, it's something which we, as I say, observed, and, and, and I think the most interesting part of it is that the CFTR is localized to goblet cells, and we might have a specific secretory mechanism which we don't have in other cells. Other goblet cells are secreting in a more normal fashion with membrane uh, vesicle fusion. So it's not all, uh, all, always like that. And we haven't, ever, we haven't looked at other places. We don't know if it is occurring in the lungs, for example, under certain conditions. I have no clue about that. But I mean, overall, I think, I think we have to be aware of that CFCR is much more uh, doing more things than we have thought of, not only providing liquid to the surface. It's doing something else also, in, for example, in, during secretion. And as a follow-up to that, do, could this account in part for the increased percentage of solids that several groups have now observed? Yeah, I mean uh, that's of course it is. It, yeah, I mean when I mean the very important is you know when if you have packed the the, the musons and you have to when you're expanding them they expand around a thousand fold and of course if you don't have sufficient amount of liquid there they won't expand and and there are mechanisms of locking the system. I mean you, you have I think you have a certain time when you secrete seconds most likely when you, during expansion if and if you don't do that quick enough it won't expand all the way there are cross links which i haven't talked about now but, but that are, are covalent cross-linking mucins and locking them in and then you can't do anything really 
So it's, it's, uh, I think the, the birth of mucus is very important. I don't know the answer to that question. We postulate that you know it's possible it has something to do with, um, and I don't know if this is true of, of um, rabbits, but for instance in mice who don't have as many glands, that they may get most of the air coming in through the nasal passages, and so they have very complicated nasal passages, and looking at rabbits snuffling all the time, I bet they do too. And so most of those particles maybe are, are being, um, uh, stopped right there, so and they're also smaller, so they're probably not going to get big particles coming through. So maybe they don't need strands. I actually thought that rabbits got submucosal glands later, but I I don't know. <laughs> I think that was rats. Rats develop submucosal rats do. glands yeah. as okay. they age. Yeah. Can I ask a question? So, uh, this question is for Dr. Cotto. Uh, is it known or are you studying the function of PRR4? <laughs> Actually, we didn't publish yet, but uh, we are now under investigation of PRR4 function, how the PRR4 stabilizes the formation of grand strand. Oh, okay. But yeah, in collaboration with the biomedical engineering team in UNC. The PR4 does not exist in pig or mouse, so that means the PR4 is not the obvious the requirement of grand mucus strand formation. So mm -hmm. we still don't know how it works. Mm -hmm. And also, the, can I answer one related to the rabbit, rabbit pig gland issue? The, Actually, in human, the submucosal gland and the smaller airway epithelium share a lot of features uh, investigated by the single cell RNA sequencing, like lysozyme, lactoferrin. These are all expressed in small distal airway epithelium. So the, this is my speculation, but rabbit that lack in gland surface epithelium may have the function to secret the glandular the component, the glandular proteins, this is just a speculation, but uh, it's interesting to know how surface epithelium function in the different animals. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> I have a question from Dr. Miller and Professor Wang. Um, there is evidence that the glands secretion of CF is This may sound like a cop-out, but I think that's why we're doing the experiments. I think it's an excellent concern, and, and we won't know, really, until we do it. I mean, yeah, no, that's the same comment, you know, and it's like a Jing-Jang, right? You want them to dislodge and all come out, but is it really going to be good when it comes out? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, is there, do you expect there to be uh, the, the side effects to be dose effects? I guess is what I'm saying. 
Yes, no, as I mentioned, the, the, the dosing was based on, I mean, we, we started with what Nam Su and Jeff have been doing in terms of uh, first with carbacol and then we're with meta, repeating with metacoline and showing that there's equivalence on the effects. And I think Nam Su has tried other cholinergics that they didn't, the data didn't look as strong. Um, and then, you know, we took that dose to then, there's quite a bit of literature as to, you know, how you transfer from an animal dose to a potential human dose, and there's this allometry concept as to how you do that, including for aerosol therapies. And then the, the next step was obviously to play with the, what is going to give us the sweet spot of having an effect without getting too close to the um, potential bronchoconstrictive effect. But there's a lot of guesswork involved in that yeah. also. <laughs> recently done um, where we actually just isolated um, surface epithelia separately from the submucosa or the um, submucosal glands and then did single cell RNA-seq of those and in our initial, we've just started um, looking at those studies, but in our initial look through at that, the cell types are the same between the EDA knockouts and the wild type groups. And I guess that's surprising a little bit because submucosal gland cell duct cells are sort of reparative during injury, right? That's your work? Your work? <laughs> so it's a, it is an interesting question. Maybe under injury conditions, you would expect to see a different kind of repair. Um, so there's a couple other questions for you, Linda, in the chat. Uh, this one is from Gary Cutting, and he asks, how does pulmonary phenotype in these pigs compare with that in the humans lacking EDA? Um, it's, it's sort of hard to answer that question um, in terms of pulmonary phenotype. There are, because there's not that many people who have it, there's a fair number, but it's not, it's a, it's a rare disease. Um, there are certainly reports of people who have um, respiratory problems and um, a lot of um, nasal crusting and otitis media suggesting that they do have infections. Um, in general, you don't see a lot of uh, people actually dying from it except very early on before they really knew what this disease was, and that might have something to do with thermoregulation. So people do have respiratory problems. Um, from the limited reports that are there, there are um, cows, uh, some population of cows that spontaneously develop this, and they do have uh, respiratory problems as well. Okay, very good. And, and for you also, Linda, from Dr. Salathe, is uh, what happens to smaller particle clearance in the EDA page? Um, we haven't studied that yet, and I think that would be a very interesting thing to look at. We know that ciliary beating doesn't change in the EDA knockouts from the wild types, so a small particle that might move through fluid or in ciliary beating, that probably would be the same. But if you had small particles that are attaching to, to mucus strands, you would expect that to, to look different. I mean, to look as the tantalum discs did, that they, they would have abrogated movement. But we haven't really studied small particles specifically. Are these pigs hard to grow? I mean, they have the hair defect and the other defects. These pigs are born, in the, except for they have that appearance. Um, and and they are um, they're viable at birth and through the uh, the early days when we study them. So they seem to be, and that that actually is also true of of the people in, that have it early on. Okay, so Dr. Fisher has another question. He's doing his moderator duty well here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his question is, does the decreased contribution of submucosal gland antimicrobial proteins predict the types of infections that people get in CF? Hmm. Maybe the airway surface epithelium protects against some, but the submucosal glands protect against others? Um, I guess that's the question. Um, I think that 
As, as Dr. Cotto said, there are some of the, like the lactoferrin and some of the others are present in the surface epithelium, but there may be more of them in the submucosal gland. So I think it would be an interesting thing to think about how much of each um, antimicrobial you might need. And for some bacteria, maybe what's present in the surface epithelia might be sufficient, you know, at least one time. And maybe for other things, you would need the whole bunch of stuff that comes from the submucosal gland and the surface epithelia. Um, and so there may be some that are just really specific for submucosal gland antimicrobials and maybe some that are specific. I guess we don't know that. Maybe with our pig we'll be able to figure that out, and I think that'll be really interesting. That is interesting. Can, yes. can I make a comment? I'm coming from the intestine, where I'm, I mean, then the crypts are the most important thing to protect. And, and if we, I mean, you think about the panet cells in the bottom of the small intestinal crypt. I mean, it might be that you need to have specific extra protection of the, of the glands, because if you get down bacteria there, then they, they will have a higher tendency to really cause severe infection. So one, I think one has to, when I think about glands, is that, they, of course, they need to protect themselves, but also they're doing it at the surface, but not only the surface, also the gland themselves. I'm fascinated by this, like, plugging of these glands, so, and, F, and no PR4 measured in some CF patients, so, and the associated hypertrophy that you see. So you have this mucus coming out, you get this plugging, and then what in the world is going on in the cells? Do they stop making more mucus? Do they, it seems like they would just respond to this environment of this big plug by atrophying rather than hypertrophying. And like, what, what do you guys think is happening in, in these glands as they're experiencing this obvious plugging that everyone is seeing? Have you counted the glands in CF patients? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, we have actually, you see uh, when you stimulate with methacholine, you see about the same number of glands, right, Namsu? But uh, we also confirmed that the hypertrophy is, uh, of course, these are end-stage lungs that we're getting. Uh, uh, I mean, they're, ex they're, they're dead. And uh, the hypertrophy is really quite astonishing. Uh, so there's been a lot of growth of the, of the glands. You probably see that, too. Well, I know, so that's a sort of counterintuitive that you have this plug and yet the gland grows and like makes more of what it can't already get out. So it's just a little bit counterintuitive to me, but that's what it is, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. all the studies show the histological analysis of the, the gland extend to the more distally and the number, of the volume increased. Actually, we have a lot of CF and other disease histologies and we Actually, we don't do, that, do the, the quantification in an organized manner, but we obviously see the grand hypertrophy in the elderly or end of stage people. Yes. I mean, in, in uh, the difference is, I think, I mean, I, could, I mean, now I give you my view, is that the, the lungs is different from the intestine, because the intestine, you always have the same system on. Uh, when you have an autobiotic mice, for example, in the intestine, uh, you, you have mucus in the same way, but it's less uh, developed. It means that it's less protective, but you still have it, and, and it, it looks essentially the same. Uh, but there are factors which are improving the stability of it that is not present that you need to have the bacteria to do. So I, I, I think it's, I think the lungs is much more complicated in the way that it can go from, from these newborn my, uh, newborn pigs we have seen, which have, I mean, really nothing affected to everything. And and I mean, when it, coming back to my my comment before on 
on uh, expression of, of uh, mucins on the surface and, and in the same cells. I mean, we that are sitting here, we, don't, we are not uh, normal, and, and all of us has, has, has both mucins expressed on the surface because we've been exposed to different things. And uh, when it comes to the question about transcription factors, we are working on it, but we have no answer to the question, really. I mean, I, I think, I think that I mean, uh, all of these, these lung diseases, they are uh, of course triggered by different mechanisms. And, but essentially, I think it comes back to a similar reaction by the by the lungs, and 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 uh, which is of course mucus protection, and and uh, and then of course could could be different uh, facets of it. For example, I mean, uh, we haven't really looked on asthma, and and. Uh, and, but I mean, according to what you can see from uh, from uh, the literature, I mean, those that you can get even with severe asthma in the old days, you can get this really plugged type of mucus, which is very elastic. And to me, it tells me that they, they have been heavily cross-linked uh, uh, covalently to, to, to do this. You see that in in all mucus, but but you, it's gone to an extreme in that case. So I think what 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 different diseases are is that they are doing essentially the same reaction but with different fundamental I mean they have different emphasis in different areas of different amounts of, of, of what is happening and and, uh, and I think that's why, why you get these different effects but still I think this attachment is the most important thing I mean, the, the way we see it is that they, they expand where they are. I mean, they're not moving. The, the, the granular stays where they are, and then they expand. And, but, but there is, a, as you can see from the movies, is that it starts from the top, which means that the signaling is coming from the top. But then it spreads down in, in, into the theca and, and takes different, different granular. And, and they seem to be more or less, you, you, I mean, you, you see several... Uh, granular expanding at the same time, but they're not together. They are usually separated. So I don't think there is any, there is no evidence, at least for any membrane or granular fusion in, inside the, 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 the cell. But again, I mean, this is from crypt of small intestine in, in mice. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have been upset about this and saying this is not true, but uh, at least at this place. How it is in other places, I don't know. I think Dr. Cato's, you know, finding, finding that PR4, which it doesn't, you can't measure it in the sputum of CF patients very well, is probably the strongest evidence that I've seen that these things really do plug in vivo. Now, I think, Taka, your, your study with before and after modulators, I think, would be extremely interesting and informative in terms of, well, number one, is PR for a good marker of this? 
And number two, does the, do the modulators um, have an effect in the semicodes of one? So I'm not sure I answered your question. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just want to specify that some may argue that PRR4 may be degraded by neutral field elastase or something by in CFA way. But we measure the neutral field elastase level are comparable among the chronic LA diseases. And we also in co incubate the neutral field elastase and PRR4 recombinant protein. And we did not see the degradation of PRR4. So the, the we believe the reduction of PRR4 we measured are, the, are not affected by the degradation. So the, we, yeah, we think the granular uh, anti -micro, micro proteins are very limited in surface airway in, the, in CF because of the lack of ground secretion. Yeah, and the inclusion of those disease controls, I think, was an important control of that and made it stronger, for sure. Yes? So I have a question. You mentioned that uh, different types of leucines have different types of uh, disulfate long cross linkages. Can, would it be possible to modulate the redox environment to um, encourage different cross linking patterns and the uh, uh, formation of like strands versus bits uh, in, in view of the initial I didn't say it was the dice of the bond differences. I mean, it's non. -di I mean, what I talked about, five uh, AC is really non dice of the bond. So that, but but it, it's uh, it's an interesting question. If it is, if these kind of things are happening, that you can change the the redox potential and I interfere with that. And uh, and and there is an interesting paper coming out soon about. Uh, 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 an oxoreductase, in, which is localized to the to the Golgi, and and it, it's it's present at, at BioRxV, so it's not secret. But anyhow, for, it's from Israel, and and uh, and they thought that this uh, oxoreductase was in the Golgi was in changing mucin uh, assembly and so on, but it's down. They didn't. It changed the glycyl transferases, so it changed glycylation instead. Totally unexpected, different outcome of that. So there is no evidence today from uh, from uh, from that. But but what we know is that the the two mucins, the 5AC mucin and the Mark II mucin, can form different type of structures. But we don't really know exactly if it's only is uh, non non uh, disulfide bond or if it is disulfide bond differences as well. We don't know. It's, we're starting to get structures of different things, so we, we might figure out one day. But today we don't know. So I think our session ends in three minutes, is that correct? I have one more question for the panelists. So we have a, probably a, some people here interested in gene therapy and gene transfer. And their question would be, do we have to target the submucosal gland to get an, um, clinical efficacy? <laughs> we still don't know, do we? Nobody wants to bet their house on it. So we have more work to do. I, I could give a quick comment only, saying that I think that the CFTR is a regulator and it will be very hard to control it because you can just think about, you, you know, uh, cholera is mediated by CFTR overactivity. So one has to be very careful when dealing, dealing with this kind of systems. And especially now, since we know it's also present in goblet cells, it's not only surface cells. It, it, it will be a difficult task to, to get somewhere there. Thank you so much, audience. Thank you. Thank you.